much. I definitely did not make a lot of money professional skateboarding. I'm like <laughs> professional skateboarders today. So I was trying to figure out how to make this engaging and, and interesting. And I, I did do the, you know, what you do before a talk now is you, you punch stuff into YouTube to see what you can find. And I did find some engaging videos, my favorite being the very elderly lady walking across the road and the guy in the Mercedes pulls up and is desperate for her to get out of the way, so he leans on the horn and she smashes her purse against the front of the Mercedes, which of course releases the airbag. <laughs> and uh, there's, you can imagine when you punch in funny seniors that you certainly get some interesting videos, uh, some of which were not actually that funny from a clinician's perspective. <laughs> so I just thought I would talk a little bit about the work that, uh, that we do, and it's definitely stress we because most of the work that I do is done very much in teams, and one of my common things in absolute all honesty it isn't so much, you know, it's it, with the patient comments on the work, you know, that the medical team has done, it's very much, you know, you've actually done the work and the team has done the work. And I think with the exception of about at 9.30 this morning, most of the time I think I have a really, really wonderful job. At 9.30 this morning there was all sorts of stuff going on in the ward and the, the uh, charge nurse's hair was standing up and there was people shouting and blah, blah, blah. But most of the time I think it, I've got a very, very wonderful job. And the reason for that is somebody asked me at lunch how I ended up working in geriatric care. And it, I happened to come by it very much by chance, but like my work in palliative care, I realized through my training in medical school and in residency that I really enjoyed working with older patients. And I think that is very much because of the connection that those patients gave me and still give me with the past. So I think. Uh, I'm actually old enough that I have had a patient who handed the flowers to Sir John A. Macdonald when he arrived by train in Kingston. I've known at least one person that was in Sarajevo the day that Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated and uh, certainly have met my share of tank commanders, etc. Uh, one of whom I'm currently in a fight about the driving issue because he sort of perceives that if he drove a tank in the Second World War, he should be okay to drive down Union Street. <laughs> So I think that uh, I really love the connection that my work gives me with the past. I, I sort of wrote a little essay recently and sort of commented that when I'm 75, I don't see how I'm going to engage the medical students of the future because I just don't think growing up in 1970s suburban Canada is really going to be quite as, as intriguing, but maybe they will find that somewhat interesting. Um, I really do feel in, in our work that we, we can make a difference and sometimes it's very small things like somebody having a small improvement in their function that leads to a modest improvement in independence. Sometimes it's taking people that have been very ill at KGH and allowing them to make gains where they're able to return home to their previous independence having been completely bedbound. Those, those sorts of differences, both the small and subtle uh, quality of life issues versus the very remarkable recoveries that people can make, those really make uh, life very satisfying. I do feel that working in a team is a big source of satisfaction with my work because working with older patients with all the complexities, there's almost no way that you're going to really make the same gains if you, know, you as the lone physician or the lone physiotherapist or the lone nurse will not really make that sort of difference when dealing with multiple illnesses, social complexity and some of the challenges that we'll talk about shortly. Um, another thing I really love about my job is 99.9% .9 of the time is teaching. Um, occasionally you run into that 0.1% that drives you crazy as, as a teacher, but most of the medical students and the medical residents are a real joy to teach. And I think that uh, being able to pass on one's own passion uh, and sometimes change people's perspective is a really important part of my work. So as Denise said, I'm the clinical leader of specialized geriatrics and have recently taken on another role at Providence Care uh, involving quality of medical care. So I've definitely got my hands full. Um, Dan is over there going, I wish he'd get his hands a little fuller. Um, <laughs> specialized geriatrics arose from what used to be called the regional geriatric program. And I just mention that because many people around the room will be familiar with that terminology of regional geriatric program. Fairly recently, Providence Care took over the program and we actually cover all of uh, southeastern Ontario. So we have a fairly small number of people who cover pretty much up to Algonquin Park, 
up uh, as far east as Prescott and as far north as Kentville type of area, you know, uh, pretty much just below Perth. So we're covering a fairly large area and when trying to talk about rehabilitation, those areas out in the far reaches of our empire, as I call it, uh, are really difficult ones to provide a rehabilitation type of approach. So we cover a large area, we do home visits uh, with uh, usually a nurse or a physiotherapist and we have a number of different spots where we do a focus on rehabilitation. And as I said to my new residents this morning, around here we're trying to focus on rehab and for some people they get admitted and they're able to go right to the gym and for others it takes days and days of work to get them either emotionally or physically or a combination of both where they're able to get to the physio gym and start to work on their goals of trying to improve their function return to the level of independence that they need to get to to get out of the hospital and back home again. We have an outpatient program that's very focused on rehabilitation which is unfortunately called the day hospital which is a term that nobody understands um, and we also have a 16 bed unit at St. Mary's of the Lake Hospital where people will come over often from Kingston General after an illness and sometimes from way out in the country because there's no other options for that person to do the rehabilitation and we really try to sort of focus on working with folks over a two to six week period and usually start off by identifying their goals you know what would you like to work on what do you need to work on and sometimes the team agrees with those goals and sometimes the team is not quite sure if we'll meet them but we we, we identify them and we'll always work on goals <coughs> I think uh, important when you were talking about geriatric rehabilitation is that it's something like a lot of areas of medicine I think it's safe to say is a little bit of an art as opposed to a science uh, I tell the the residents that you as a doctor play an important role even if you don't do anything from the point of view of changing medications or ordering this lab test ordering that lab test and uh, we actually take the residents down on what I call the tour de physio so the whole medical team goes down to the physio gym and we'll sort of we'll cheer the person on we'll joke with them um, we'll try to sometimes cajole them to participate a little bit more you know sort of find any strategies to really engage the patient in the process of, uh, of rehabilitation so I really think that there's a bit of a, a, a philosophy and an art um, and I think importantly we get a lot of patients that say I'm 96 what's the point of me doing rehabilitation um, but one of the first papers I ever wrote was actually entitled rehabilitation in a palliative care setting and it told the story of a fellow and I always remember stories well he his job was writing the instruction manuals for Rolls Royces which I thought was kind of an interesting type of job. I don't think he got to drive a lot of Rolls Royces, but he knew them very well. And when he came in for, to the palliative care unit essentially to die, he sort of said, is it okay if I feel a little bit better if I have some friends over? Mm -hmm. So we took a rehabilitation approach. He actually functionally improved, was able to leave the hospital and go to, uh, I think it was to a nursing home or even a, a, a heavy care retirement home. But before he did, he got well enough that we actually had to stop the parties that he was holding. <laughs> the nurses pulled back the, 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 the big wooden cupboards we had in those days, and he had a whole row of those little rum bottles, you know, that you get in the airplane. So I think at that point, he felt that rehabilitation was futile, and we managed, I think, to convince ourselves and him that uh, it was worth that participation, and small gains made a very large impact on his life. I think it should be worth noting that the complex continuing care and the geriatric inpatient rehabilitation unit uh, the year before last actually got the highest rating of patient satisfaction in Ontario so we became the the new uh, benchmark and I think that uh, that's something that I sort of joke that we talk about outcomes in rehabilitation it's very difficult to measure outcomes for outpatient geriatric rehabilitation there's a very large literature that says you know are day hospitals effective we tend to view our successes in whether the person is able to walk better, whether they return back to where they were, and also the number of fruit baskets we get. So, and I think that uh, we recently had a lady who came over for rehabilitation who was very ill, worked very, very hard, but did have a, a, an increase in her illness and ended up dying. And I said to the residents, you know, this lady came for rehabilitation we have still got, the team has got a lovely fruit basket. That suggests that even though we didn't meet the goal, we provided good care. 
So I think that the ministry doesn't look at fruit baskets as being an important outcome, but I think it is relevant to us. As I mentioned, one of the real pleasures is working with junior doctors and really changing their perspectives for caring for older people. And it's very funny that the, quite often the, the junior medical students will go, wow, I can't believe how much fun my patients are. You know, so they have this perception of older people as being very fragile and something to be almost a little frightened of. And when they learn how to examine particularly frail older people, like nobody in this room at all, uh, they really do have this impression if they push too hard with their stethoscope, they're going to break something. What they don't know is that human seniors are about the toughest thing on the planet. Um, but they also don't really perceive caring for them as being interesting or engaging until they actually do it. And I do love that quote, wow, I can't believe how fun my patients were. You know, and I think that sort of say, sit down on the bed, enjoy, hear the stories, tell your own stories, and really engage the patient. The other thing, as I mentioned, is they get exposure on our rehabilitation settings to interdisciplinary care. So medical education is moving from, you know, where the doctor learns all that the doctor needs to do and then goes out and provides that care. Increasingly, medical education focuses on trying to teach people to work in teams. Um, to be honest, it's not quite there yet, and uh, working at St. Mary's of the Lake in either inpatients or outpatients is an excellent exposure to true interdisciplinary care. And I've got to leave at 1 o'clock to sit through a two-hour team meeting, which at the end of it, we definitely need coffee, but we get a lot of work done. What are opportunities, or what are challenges first? It's safe to say that I've been in practice for 23 years now, and I think that uh, there's a lot more older people about. Uh, my own saying is that 90 is the new 80, and I think it is very true that the number of people I see who are over age 90 and who have very significant multiple health problems. So it's not uncommon for me. In fact, I looked at a chart of a 96-year-old lady who uh, whose listing of medical problems was diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, previous stroke, uh, dementia, recurrent falls, uh, hypercalcemia. I could actually go on for another minute or so with some of our folks. So the level of complexity is staggering, and I think the level of social complexity, as Denise had mentioned, there's a lot of caregivers and situations out there where people are extremely challenged and where the resources have improved over my, my career, but where there's still a big shortfall. Um, I think there's changing expectations of patients and families. I saw somebody recently in clinic because they were finding after a five mile hike that they were more tired than they used to be. You know, I think this was somebody in their late 70s. So that is wonderful, but it's gonna pr produce a whole source of challenges. When the current baby boomers are 80, I'm gonna be retired myself, but I think that they will not be as easy as the average 80-year-old person who grew up on a farm north of Napanee, who will take just about anything that life throws at them. Um, so I think there's interesting challenges ahead. Um, I think there's a changing expectation of families, uh, really expecting uh, as you know more than families used to expect, which is good, but also means there's sometimes a gap between what can be done and what the expectations are. <laughs> And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be an awful lot more drivers, and one of the toughest parts of my job is taking people's licenses away, so uh, especially retired tank commanders. <laughs> what are opportunities? I think that the major change in family medicine and primary health really offers some wonderful opportunities for things like rehabilitation within the family health team as opposed to the person having to come to St. Mary's, for example. And we're trying to make linkages with the family health teams to try to have not only clinics, but also more coordinated rehabilitation within the different family health teams. Um, there is new funding for family physicians like myself who have additional training in care of the elderly, meaning that I know in an office I need to spend more time with an older patient um, so it means that I spend more time with the older patient and get paid exactly the same as the person that shoves the person through. So if you take additional training so you're a more experienced and expert at care of older people, um, I think the government's recognizing there needs to be different ways of funding that. And we'd like to use some of that funding to provide rehabilitation centers out in the, uh, the further reaches of our empire. There is a greater recognition of the need to do rehabilitation in acute care, although at the moment people still wait days and days at KGH before a physiotherapist is able to see them because there is a wait list for physio at KGH. 
They know the need is there, and I guess that's a start. Um, the new building and the concept of elder-friendly hospitals will have a very large impact on rehabilitation, uh, meaning that if hospitals are designed better and care is provided better so that people don't lose as much ground because they go into the hospital, it means less work for me, which is good. And obviously, more importantly, less people needing rehabilitation after a simple admission for pneumonia or a urinary tract infection. Our new building is very exciting. For once, we'll be all together doing rehabilitation as opposed to three floors apart. Um, and I think that our ability to work as inpatients and outpatients together will be quite remarkably better. So there's lots of opportunities. However, as was mentioned, the aging population or the number of older people is, is growing. And I think without health promotion, we will be overwhelmed. So I, everybody here looks like they're active and engaged. And I think that uh, we need younger people to get active and engaged to prevent the type of aging that has happened in the past. Um, in the future, the goal of geriatric medicine is really having a, what we call a shortened period of morbidity, meaning that you're living independently and well, and then you have a shorter period of illness and disability uh, before you die. And our goal is to try to shorten that period of functional limitation and illness as little as possible so people are living longer but having less illness at the end of life. Fortunately, no matter what happens, they'll still need geriatric rehabilitation, so I do have a job for the rest of my career, I would assume. So I hope that's given you a, a rough idea of some of the pros and the cons, the challenges, and I think the opportunities in the world of geriatric rehabilitation. It's not a long time to talk about it, and I'm getting the you know, kind of look there saying, I've got to talk soon, get off the podium. <laughs> So I'm a great person for using quotes to sometimes make points or to guide myself. I couldn't find a lot of quotations really good for rehabilitation. A couple of them that do relate to aging that I particularly like uh, and aren't relevant to my talk, but I'm going to tell you them anyway. Uh, particularly relevant today is G.K. Chesterton who said, I know a lot of people who want to live forever but don't know what to do with themselves on a rainy Sunday afternoon. <laughs> I think it's food for thought. Um, <coughs> And I, I'm having a moment because I can't remember what my other quote was. <laughs> it was uh, John Mortimer who sort of very, very relevant to my work, which is, he said, uh, no pleasure is worth foregoing for an extra three months in the geriatric ward. <laughs> but I think the quote that does relate to rehabilitation, I found last night from Charles M. Schultz, which said, remember this, once you're over the hill, you pick up speed. <laughs> Thank you.